Uh, all right, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Dylan Fox. I'm the Director of Operations for XR Access. Um, if this is your first time joining us, we are an initiative of Cornell Tech uh, focused on making XR, which is virtual, augmented, and mixed reality, uh, accessible for people with disabilities. Um, we are joined today by the team from Scene Weaving, an interactional metaphor to enable blind users' experience in 3D virtual environments. Um, this is something that uh, I think is really exciting to, to me, at least, because the challenges of low vision users um, in using VR are, I think, some of the, the most notoriously tricky to solve uh, compared to many other disabilities. Um, so uh, I am happy to welcome uh, the scene weaving team here. Um, I will go ahead and let you all uh, introduce yourselves real quickly, um, and then you all can take it away. Uh, so Dahlia, why don't you go ahead and go first? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Dahlia Perez. Uh, pronouns are she, her. I'm a senior product manager in the Microsoft Mesh team and um, have long, dark hair and um, am a multiracial person with big silver hoop earrings. And I'll pass it to Tom. Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Tom Gale. Uh, I'm a researcher at Microsoft, a user researcher. Um, I work on mixed reality, Surface, and, and other products uh, in the organization, mostly devices. Uh, and one of the areas I work on is, is input uh, experiences, including accessibility. So uh, I'm a uh, mid-30s white male, very bald, with, uh, with a bit of a beard going uh, and glasses. Um, I will hand it over to Martin. Thanks, Tom. Uh, my name is Martin Grayson. Uh, I am a engineer at Microsoft Research. Um, I work in a small team called the Teachable AI Experiences team. And we love to imagine uh, technologies. We build prototypes. We challenge machine learning with um, all sorts of interesting questions, uh, and particularly for thinking about you know, where there are gaps in these places you know, or where uh, we can maybe improve or change things uh, to help everybody have the, have the best experience with these types of technology. Um, I am a early 40s male. I, uh, like Tom, also have very little hair on top of my head. Um, I would love to grow a beard, but um, I, can't get the, uh, I can't get the thickness. So um, I'm, I'm beardless as well. Uh, I will hand on to my colleague, Harsha. Thanks, Martin. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Harshada Bala Subramanian. I go by Harsha, so feel free to call me that. Um, I, I identify as a blind South Asian woman in my late 20s. Uh, I was a former intern at uh, Microsoft Research in the Teachable AI Experiences team and also in Mixed Reality. Um, I am currently a PhD student in the Center for Digital Anthropology at UCL. I'll pass over to my colleague, Janat. Uh, thanks, Harsha. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Janat Mukhataeva. I'm from Kazakhstan. I had an internship with Microsoft last summer, and we um, worked together on a scene weaver project. Um, uh, currently, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Nazarbayev University at the Institute of Smart Systems and Artificial Intelligence. And I am 30. I, I look Asian and have uh, long brown hair. Um, let me pass to to Shiri. Oh. I, I think we can we can skip Shiri and Adelaide oh. since I, I think they, they yes. were expecting to be part of the uh, part of the Sorry, panel. I wasn't expect I wasn't expecting to <laughs> yeah. introduce myself. Um I'll just say that I'm I'm Shiri Azenkut and I'm the executive director and I will let you, Dylan, continue hosting. Sure, sure. Um yeah, and I'll to to this is Dylan to uh, to belatedly describe myself. I'm a, a white man, um short uh, kind of curly black hair and a, a a beard that's probably getting a little too long for its own good. Um but um wearing a uh I've I've I'm doing double duty on marketing today. I've got the extra access t shirt and the extra access zoom background. So uh just in case there's any confusion. <laughs> um all right, but um yeah, I think with that, uh, Dahlia, please take it away. 
Yeah, just want to give a warm welcome to all of you to our uh, presentation today, Scene Weaving, an Interactional Metaphor to Enable Blind Users' Experience in 3D Virtual Environments. Um, I'm so, um, we are all so excited to be here today and so honored, and um, I'm going to pass it um, to Harsha, Martin, and Zanat for the first section of the presentation. Thank you so much, Dahlia. Uh, can I just confirm that that we have slides and that everyone can see them on screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So now three-dimensional or 3D digital content is becoming more widespread, as we all know. Uh, it's turning up in contexts including the workplace and education and entertainment. However, 3D virtual environments are currently inaccessible to people who are blind. This is because existing screen reading solutions for two uh, uh, for two dimensional or two D content cannot be extended to achieve the necessary embodied spatial presence that we are after in three D spaces. We argue that any assistive system for blind users uh, who are trying to access virtual environments should afford spatial presence and forefront perceptual agency. In order to guide and sensitize designers and engineers, we offer an interactional metaphor for enabling blind users to choose how and when they perceive a virtual environment and interact with the people in it. Metaphors have been long used in computing to explain new and complex processes by referring to more familiar um, as aspects of everyday life. So for example, think about how the desktop metaphor, for example, informs how you manage your files on your computer. We propose scene weaving, an interactional metaphor that draws on the practice of weaving to explain how blind users could come to perceive in 3D virtual environments in a way that emphasizes spatial presence and perceptual agency. I'll first outline the key elements of this metaphor and the design guidelines that it produces. I'll then hand over to Mike colleagues who will show how these guidelines can be implemented in practice. Uh, so Martin will take us through a demo of our first prototype for desktop-based interactions. Jeanette will, uh, will illustrate how this prototype can be extended to accommodate interactions that happen through VR headsets. Um, and Dahlia will close us off by reflecting on the wider impact um, of these guidelines on user interfaces. Next slide, please. Thank you. So why should we move on from existing screen reading solutions, such as screen readers? Well, firstly, what are screen readers, right? Screen readers enable blind people to access and interact with 2D digital content by speaking the textual uh, parts of, a, of, um, of, of uh, all the details that are on a screen and these details can be navigated by keyboard shortcuts or screen-based gestures. Non-textual visual content such as pictures may be verbally described too. However, screen readers present information in a largely linear way, making it difficult to quickly understand the relationship between objects and places. Users must first draw on multiple audio streams or map out information by going over it repeatedly. Both of these tasks can be cognitively exhausting. Lists or grids can provide a way to listen to textual information, but uh, again, um, uh, this information is taken in uh, through verbal audio, and therefore this reduces the speed of interactions, which can be particularly restrictive during fast-paced social interactions. Users can customize screen readers, such as adjusting their speed or their verbosity, but the order in which information can be surfaced and hence comes to frame what is uh, discovered next is largely predetermined. In other words, interactive 3D virtual environments assign users an active role in curating information, whereas screen readers limit blind people's control over the information that they receive. Now, we do value and want to foreground the groundbreaking research that uh, has been done um, that uh, 
tries to widen the range of modes through which blind users can perceive, such as spatialized audio and haptics in virtual environments. But what this work does not seem to consider, perhaps, is how blind individuals bring together multiple strands of information to build a coherent scene. To answer this question, we want to turn to sense-making scholarship, which argues that individuals do not passively absorb information, resulting in accurate mental representations of their social and sensory world. Instead, uh, influenced by our context, each of us may draw on something different in our virtual environments, and we may use um, different strategies to integrate uh, these cues into a coherent understanding. So what this means is that what we vary, sorry, what we perceive will vary. So for example, a user who is navigating um, an environment for the first time may seek out different perceptual cues at different times to someone who is just having a chat with a virtual companion. Through the emphasis on sense-making, we are saying that virtual environments are not singular entities to be described, um, but that users prioritize and integrate perceptual cues in the environment to sense-make a scene that is specific to their interests and their abilities and their goals. Next slide, please. Thanks. Here follow four aspects of weaving practice which have inspired us alongside with how each of these aspects will explain our approach to perception uh, and um, the design guidelines that will result from this approach. So in weaving, um, weavers choose and weave together specific threads to make a fabric. This is similar to how in perception, users draw out perceptual cues uh, that are available in the environment and weave them together as in sense making to create an understanding of a scene, right? Therefore, when we design, we believe that we should provide multi-sensory ways um, of drawing out information. In weaving, weavers follow each interlacing of thread with the movement of their fingers, being constantly reminded of how they are situated in relation to um, the fabric that they are weaving and the threads that they are bringing together to form this fabric. This is similar to how in perception, users surface and in integrate perceptual cues in a way that is spatial, i.e. users know how they are situated um, as they are forming an understanding of the scene around them. Therefore, when designing, we should encourage the embodiment of spatial understanding. In weaving, it's possible to weave different patterns with the same threads according to the user's intentions and their context. This is similar to how in perception, we think that users' intentions, their previous experiences, uh, their expectations or their social norms might all contribute to which perceptual cues they detect, how they bring them together and which order they bring them together in. So when designing, we believe that we should enable user control of information flow. Lastly, in weaving, knots are points of dynamism in that they mark transitions between weaving patterns um, and the weavers have to engage with multiple threads at the same time. This is similar to how in perception, when users interact with others, they must engage with multiple cues at the same time while maintaining an awareness of um, what this could mean for their understanding of the wider scene. So when, so when designing something, we should attend to the different temporal demands of environmental exploration versus social interaction. To make our metaphor even more tangible, um, here is our first iteration of a prototype system. It shows how um, it shows how our proposed design guidelines uh, can be applied in a virtual museum scenario. Over to Martin.
Thank you, Harsha. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm just going to enable sound sharing and do a quick sound check. Uh, share. Okay, I believe I'm sharing sound. I'm just going to make a sound yeah. in the demo. We've got it, Martin. Can you hear those tappings? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, cool. So, the technology we live in uh, and the work uh, and, and the technology we work with can become very meaningful to us. It could be your first phone, the games arcade you used to play with your friends, or the computer you had in your first job. Now imagine you seek out opportunities to discover vintage tech that takes you back to those important memories. And you've just found out about a virtual reality exhibition called The History of Work. And you realise that it may be the best chance to re-encounter some of these iconic pieces that are physically quite hard to get hold of nowadays. Now, also, unlike in a physical exhibition, you'll not need a person to guide you around who may influence your experience and the things you see. You can explore the space and the objects in your own time and in your own way. So we are in our virtual exhibition space. And first things first is I want to get an idea of this ex exhibition space. This is my first time here, so I have no idea where I am. If I tap the X key on my keyboard, I can tap my foot. I can listen to how the sound echoes around the space, and this lets me know what's in front of me. There's quite a lot of echo, so this might be a large or long room. I can turn, I can tap the left or right arrow keys, and this will turn me left and right respectively. With each tap, I turn 30 degrees, like the numbers on a clock face, so that sa and the sound that is generated responds to the environment around me. So if I turn slowly right, and then tap my foot again, I can hear that there is much less echo than before. And this tells me that there's a wall in front of me that's probably much closer. If I turn to my left, it's very much the same. So what I'm learning from here is my starting point, I have a wall quite close to me on my left and right side, and this room seems quite long. I can also use a sweep. This lets me use my mouse or trackpad to explore what's around me by moving my index finger from left to right. As I do this, I'm going to hear some different sounds that will help me help describe to me what's around. Those little ping sounds are objects that I might want to interact with. The thumps that I heard let me know that there are walls. The clap sounds, that lets me know that there's a person there too. I can also expand the radius of this sweep and actually hear the names of some of the things that are around. And I can go further away too. For this, I move my finger up and down on my trackpad. Old mobile phone, coffee machine, water cooler, IBM PC. Okay, so there's definitely some things around. And each click lets me know when that distance changes by two meters. So talking of distance, let's see just how big this room is. I'm going to walk forwards. I'm going to walk forwards just by holding W, my key. I heard a ping on my right there, so that means I just walked past an object that I can take a look at later. Film room. Ah, film room. And that knock I just heard lets me know that I've reached a surface or a table. If I toggle on my gaze mode by pressing G, I'm going to hear announcements of objects as my look direction crosses over them. Gaze on. Vending machine. Okay, so there's a vending machine. Jack. There's Jack. Jack. Projector. And there's a projector in front of me as well. Gaze off. I'm also noticing that there's much less echo where I am now. So the film room seems like it might be a smaller space than I was in before. In fact, I wonder what other rooms there are in the exhibition. The navigator is a tool that helps me quickly hear about the environment. I can learn about the places, the people and the things. If I press and hold the space bar, the navigator activates. Places. With the navigator tool open, I can use the left and right arrow keys to flick between items. I'm currently on places, so let's see what places we have around. Film room. Film room, okay, that's where I am now. Main hall. Main hall, that must have been where I came from. Retro office desk. A retro office desk. Modern office desk. And a modern office desk. With the navigator, I can discover details about a place before I go there, and this can help me make faster choices about what I'm going to see next. For example, if I focus on a place, 
I can tap different keys to hear things. I can use O, for example, to hear a description of the room. Let's hear a description of the film room. Film room. Take a seat and watch a short movie about the latest tech offices throughout the 80s and 90s. Very cool. With the I key, I can hear about interactive objects. There are two interactive objects. P tells me about people that are in the room. Jack is in this room. And L tells me a little bit more about the shape and location of the room. Medium sized round room at the end of the main hall. If more information is available on any of these keys, I can discover it simply by tapping the key a second time and this will share the new details. I want to find a room that has multiple objects so there's more for me to interact with. This room just had two objects, so let's try the main hall. Main hall. There are six interactive objects. I think it said that there are six interactive objects. Uh, I can have the, uh, I can have, I can hear that repeated louder by tapping my R key. There are six interactive objects. That's better. I want to know more before I head over there. So if I tap I again, I can actually hear a little bit more details about these objects. Showcase, ob showcase objects are on tables in the center of the room. You can see the evolution of the office computer along the left wall and two large cabinets show classic desk gadgets and stationery. That sounds pretty fascinating. If I tap enter, uh, I'm going to use the navigator to teleport back to the main hall. Main hall. So in the main hall, if I want to hear about the objects that are around me, I can use the navigator this time to select things rather than places and my left and right arrow keys to hear what objects are around. So let's do that. Places. Things. With things selected, I can now hear about the different things. And each announcement I hear is going to be spatialized as well. So I know what direction the object is in. Coffee machine, laser printer, projector, IBM PC, vending machine, old mobile phone, water cooler, arcade machine. OK, lots of different uh, lots of different objects. And the last one I heard there was the arcade machine. Uh, now, that's something I definitely want to check out. But first of all, I want to find out if there's anyone already using the arcade machine or having a look. So I tap P to find out. Nobody is interacting with the arcade machine. Okay, great. No one's there. So it might be a great time to jump over and take a look while I still have the chance. I can tap enter and I'll be whisked over. As soon as I reach the object, I heard that ping sound. That lets me know that I've arrived at the object and it's also telling me that I can interact with this object. Let's see what I can do with this particular object. If I hold down my right shift button, the object interaction menu opens. Play theme tune. And I can check out the different things with my up and down arrows. Play a game. Play a game? That sounds good to me. Let's have a go. Play theme tune. Play a game over. Finish that. That brings back so many fond memories. Now, while I was playing, I also heard these two chimes coming to my right. Those two sounds let me know that two more people had arrived in the exhibition space. This time I can use the navigator to find out wh which people are around to see who came in. One moment. Things. People. I'm going to select people. Taylor. Taylor. Richard. Richard. Oh, Richard, that name rings a bell. Let me find out who, uh, who Richard is. Curator of the museum and collector of objects and stories about the history of office work. OK, so Richard is actually the cu uh, curator of the museum. I can find out if Richard's with anyone as well by tapping P. Talking to Jordan. Talking to Jordan. Uh, I must go and say hello to both of them uh, at some point. So to help me stay aware of changes that might be happening spontaneously around me while I'm either interacting with objects or people, I can turn on something called the interaction knot. I turn this on by tapping N. Notifications on. Notifications are on. Now this feature notifies me about specific types of information that I've already requested to be told about, like people approaching me or somebody raising their hand. The information types that I may request to know about could depend on the context or where I am. With these notifications, I don't need to spend too much time looking for information uh, whilst I'm doing other tasks, such as talking to people. Now, just then I heard a notification sound, so I can tap N to find out what just happened. Taylor approaching 10 seconds ago. One more notification. So it sounds like Taylor came over 10 seconds ago. Aliana approaching 30 seconds ago. Aliana approached 30 seconds ago and there was one more notification there too. Jack approaching 10 seconds ago. Jack approached as well. 
it sounds like I have a bit of an audience whilst I'm looking at this arcade machine. So maybe I should show them something about it. Let's do something with the arcade machine. Play theme tune. Yes, let's play the theme tune. Fantastic. Ah, there was another notification there. Let me listen to that one. Aliana raised hand just now. Aliana has just raised her hand. I can actually respond to certain notifications by tapping en enter, and this will orientate me to look at the person, letting them know that I'm actually paying attention to them. Hi, do you know that theme tune? Yes, of course I do. It's Pac-Man. The notifications in the interaction lock allow me to keep pace with the changes in our group, know when people want to interact or share their experience of the arcade uh, with me too. We hope that you've enjoyed this introduction to scene weaving, and I'm now going to pass you back to Harsha just to summarise a little bit about what we've seen. I don't know saying, that was brilliant. Like the nerd in me gets so happy when we do that demo. <laughs> um, so let's just take a brief moment to reflect on how the prototype uh, that we've just gone through has um, or fulfills the guidelines uh, that we outlined at the top of our presentation. So first, the prototype offers spatialized, nonverbal, embodied understanding. So there is environmental and spatialized audio, which is nonverbal. Um, the spatialized footstep and rotation sounds, for example, tell users where they are as they move. And other spatialized audio cues inform users about the relative location and type of objects and surfaces they may come across as they're moving around. Second, the prototype offers a variety of perceptual cues. So I talked about nonverbal, there's also verbal stuff. There are three design elements in um, our virtual museum scenario, which specifically speak to this spec. So the gaze mode helps users hear uh, verbal confirmation of the nonverbal cues that they are moving through helping to clarify and enrich their understanding. The left-right sweep on the trackpad helps to check what is on either side of the user as they are standing still in the virtual environment. It resembles, in fact, the motion of sweeping a cane to some extent. And so uh, the information is drawn out through both audio and tactility. Uh, the radial sweep will gauge um, items that are further away and so this helps to plan before you, uh, you teleport. Here users can control the speed at which they become aware of objects and people's relative location around them as well as the amount of warning they get to prepare for interacting with these objects and people. Third, the prototype can adapt to users' different contexts. So for example, we offer the navigator. This provides a menu through which users can quickly find out about the people, places, and things in an environment. We recognize that not everyone will have the time or the energy to take uh, time to explore and walk around. So the three categories of information in the navigator can be expanded and tailored to the environment that you're building. So um, uh, as we have showed, environment builders can add information hierarchies through which users can go deeper to learn more about um, the object that they are in front of, for example. So its size, its location, and whether there are any other people nearby. Lastly, the prototype helps users to participate in fast-paced social interaction. For example, we offer the interaction not um, uh, to refer to moments where a social interaction can happen. Um, the notifications are surfaced quickly wherever users are situated, meaning that they can keep up with um, the pace of social, uh, social interactions without being distracted uh, from building the wider understanding of the scene that they have been doing up to this point. Um, now, 
uh, it's time to discover how this can work in virtual reality. And with that, I'll hand over to Jeanette. Uh, thanks, Harsha. Uh, for the um, virtual reality extension of Scene Weaver prototype, we have used the Oculus Quest uh, um, VR system uh, composed of the headset and two hand controllers. And um, uh, when users were donning the headset and also uh, holding the controllers in their hands, we had an access uh, to the uh, head movements of the user and also hand movements. For the uh, head movements, it was very easy that users could uh, turn around in order to find out what's around. Uh, however, for uh, tracking the hand movements, um, we found out that it's very important to uh, spatialize the controllers. In our case, we kept one of the controllers stationary, and the other control was moving um, with respect uh, to the stationary controller. For example, we had a left-hand controller uh, stationary, and the um, right-hand controller was moving uh, to uh, different directions and also uh, different angles. For example, in the case of um, uh, left and right sweep, we were uh, moving the right-hand controller slightly to the left in order to find out what's in the left side and then uh, come back to the um, uh, stationary controller. And then we were, we were moving to the right in order to find out what's in the right side um, from the user. Uh, the same gesture for the radial sweep, but um, the direction is uh, to the front and uh, to the backwards to the stationary controller. And by changing uh, the, the distance between controllers, for example, um, we could change the um, radius of scanning uh, of the environment in the radial sweep gesture. And um, one more example is uh, finding out uh, um, more, more, more information about a selected object. For example, we had a gesture of making a square. Starting from the um, stationary controller, we were moving um, a square in the uh, 3D space uh, with the right-hand controller. Um, we also had a user studies in order to evaluate the uh, gestures we have developed in order to experience the 3D environment. And we found out um, that uh, usually people experience uh, 3D uh, um, uh, differently than 2D and um, their expectations also change, meaning that um, whenever one can move the head and hands, the question is why I cannot move my body? Uh, meaning that one of the user suggested us to have the um, um, uh, to, to be able to work in the real environment and um, at, at the same time explore as a virtual environment. Um, one more suggestion was uh, to add more interactivity to the objects. For example, uh, when, uh, when we interact with coffee machine, uh, currently uh, we have a spatialized uh, sound of coffee uh, um, machine and um, the user uh, suggested us to have some interactions with the coffee machine, for example, uh, taking the cup, uh, putting the cup uh, to, uh, to the coffee machine and taking the cup back, um, using the uh, haptic feedback from the hand controllers. And one more suggestion that um, uh, Harsha um, shared with us was that um, it would be very nice to find out the size and uh, texture of interactive objects. For example, um, when we want to interact with coffee machine, we can come close to the coffee machine table and find out with controllers um, what is the size of the uh, table and what is the texture of the table and find out where in the table um, the coffee machine is located, again, using the haptic feedback from the controllers. At this, at this point, let me pass to Dahlia. Thanks so much, Zanat. Um, I think there was one more summary slide that maybe Harsha was going to speak to, or maybe this was Zanat's. I think this slide should have been on for the last uh, for the last few comments. So apologies, Zanat, for not advancing. Oh, but it is. Uh, you summed it very well. <laughs> Great. 
Um, hi, everyone. My name again is Dahlia Perez, product manager in Microsoft Mesh team. And I thought I would kick us off by just um, explaining a little bit about what Mesh is. And so there are actually three product verticals. And thank you, Martin. Um, I'm showing three um, images side by side here. Um, on the left, the first one is um, a visual image of avatars for teams. So that's um, one of our mesh product experiences is avatars for teams. We actually have do have um, screen reading, um, a self voice screen reader for avatars for teams, um, and um, also had some pretty exciting collaborations on that screen reader um, on ways that we describe in intersectional ways, um, how do avatars look, right? Which touches on gender, on race, um, on body sizes, things that can be um, like sens sensitive, geopoliticized, et cetera. And so um, we did some really good collaborative work um, with like blind um, communities of color, et cetera, to figure out what are the best and most efficient ways to have screen reading describe avatars. Um, so that is avatars. In the middle is um, immersive spaces in teams. So this is um, the, um, the entry point is being in a Teams meeting similar to Zoom, where you can um, enter an immersive view experience um, and be in a virtual world with other avatars um, through the portal of a Teams meeting. Um, and then the third is um, the Mesh standalone app, which is um, has much much more complex capabilities than immersive spaces and teams um, where there are developer tools, people can customize and build their own worlds. Um, and um, many of our customers right now are using this for things like um, new employee onboarding experiences, all hands meetings, et cetera. So those are really the three kind of product verticals for Microsoft Mesh. Um, and I want to acknowledge, um, if you go to the next slide, um, the journey um, that we had to figuring out accessibility um, tools for blind and partially sighted users in Microsoft Mesh really started. Big shout out to um, the blind burners. And that's really how I got my introduction to Harsha. Um, and I quote Chris Hainsworth here from Blind Burners, um, who met with us and said, you have broken assumptions and broken software, right? So many of us had heard this kind of ableist thinking of like, um, um, to quote, um, why would a blind person want to enter a virtual reality space, right? This is a visual medium. Um, and through the process of partnering with blind burners who um, in many ways had frustration not being able to join Altspace VR during Burning Man um, because of that lack of inter interoper interoperability with OS level um, as assistive tools and um, the Altspace VR application, we really um, sparked this partnership um, of innovation of like, what are the ways to unlock those accessibility features and also to do them in a way that uh, reimagines how we understand screen reading for 2D in an immersive space. And so um, enter scene weaving and the, the amazing uh, demo and prototype that um, Harsha, Martin, and Zanat just shared with us. Um, so to the next slide, just to articulate, um, you know, why we have these unique challenges um, for Mesh and other like 3D immersive experiences, um, you know, on the engineering side, um, Unity-based applications are, you know, quote, closed boxes or black boxes um, is what I hear engineering um, call it, right? The metadata is not exposed to um, JAWS or to Windows Narrator or these assistive tools um, that many users um, um, have open if they're entering via at like a 2D, um, a 2D experience. Um, and for things like Oculus Quest and um, other 3D headsets, um, the OS level assistive tools are kind of starting from the ground up at this moment. Um, and so there's, you know, really kind of an industry wide um, 
movement, I think that we all need to have to join forces at what that best practice is on exposing, having APIs and exposing the right metadata um, to OS level tools, right? Um, we And we know this is a pain point across industry. We know lots of different games have like a different self-voiced app um, from game to game, which is like kind of a horrible end user experience, right? Um, and then the challenges for design are, you know, that a lot of the existing standards and best practices for screen reading just simply don't apply to 3D spaces or interactions. Um, so as we saw from um, the demo and prototype that was just shared, that 3D worlds have complex interactions that are in um, not really compatible with existing, you know, command and control, voice input and keyboard navigation. Um, and we can move on to the next slide. Um, so I have um, Ami Charnoff is was supposed to join us here today. Ami is a designer, um, an interaction designer on the Mesh team, um, who really um, took the the learnings and the principles from the scene weaving project to figure out how would we um, integrate something like this. Um, basically um, to translate the 3D content into a 2D UI overlay. Um, so it's a recognizable interaction model, um, buttons, lists, things that people can tab through um, with keyboard navigation, um, but use this kind of concept of agentic exploration of a space that Harsha was talking about um, so that the user can decide what piece of information they want to explore, whether it's people, places, and things. Um, so I'll let um, Martin share. Um, uh, we may not need have time for the entire video, but you can get a sense of um, this is a virtual meeting room. So someone is sharing a screen in the middle, um, and there's also breakout rooms and other avatars in the space. And um, Ami is going to talk through what the 2D overlay experience looks like. Okay, so here we are. In... Okay, so here we are in an immersive space in Microsoft Mesh. Um, in this demo, you can see I'm controlling my avatar in third person view, and there are two other avatars in the space with me, Jerity and Melody, and then it looks like there are three people joining this meeting remotely, um, Ami, David Klein, and Ali, and someone is saying, in a PowerPoint presentation as well. Um, we're going to toggle the screen mode on uh, with our mouse, but you know, ideally users would use a keyboard to do it. Scene reader button. Participants button. Okay, now that the screen reader mode is toggled, I'm going to shift focus to the top item, at, uh, uh, the top menu item. Conference room tab. This is what we call the places menu. This is what would allow users to scroll through and um, explore what different rooms are available in this 3D world. And it works similar to menu at the top of a traditional 2D website, where you know it's made up of a few different tabs and users use their arrow keys to move between them. Breakout room A tab. Breakout room B tab. So as you can tell, um, it just reads out the name of each room. Um, but let's go back to conf the, the, let's go back to the first item real quick. Breakout conference room tab. This is where we currently are. And if we press enter, we'll get a list of interaction options. Move here button. We don't have to move here because we're already here, but let's hear uh, a description of what this place might look like. Description button. This is a conference room with a large U-shaped table surrounded by chairs. There are grassy vines going up the back walls towards the high glass ceiling, and there are clear windows at the front of the room which overlook several mountain tops high in the clouds. So I'm not the best at writing alt text, um, but that's just an example. Ideally, you know, any designer that's creating a 3D space could input any description of what the place looks like. Um, but we also want to make sure the users can quickly know who's in which room as well. So they have the option to hear a list of people in each room. People button. Jared and Melody are in this room, along with Ami, Ally, and David who are each joining remotely. So again, uh, the three options for interacting with um, uh, uh, tabs in the places menu is move here, description, and people. Uh, let's press escape and close this menu. Conference room tab. And press tab again. People and we'll shift focus to this combo box. This is what we call the object filter. It's what allows you to determine what type of objects you want to interact with in the space. Right now it's set to people, but if we were to press enter, people. 
We would see that it expands, and we can choose between people, things, things, all, and all. Um, we're gonna leave it at people for now. Thing, people. And press enter. People. And then press tab again. Jared button. And we'll shift focus to the first person in the space. And we can use our arrow keys to move between different people. Melody button. Ami, remote button. And uh, since Ami, David Klein, and Ali are each doing it remotely, um, David, remote button. Ally, remote button. It says that um, when you focus over them. And if you notice, um, the view of the room actually rotates as you shift uh, focus from item to item. And, you know, that's because we want to make sure that users aren't limited to interacting with the objects that are currently in field of view. But they can actually interact with all of the objects in the 3D, in the 3D space in 360 degrees around them. Just like how on a website, when you scroll through items, um, the website scrolls down uh, with you. Let's go back to Jared again. David, Ami, remote melody button, Jared button. And press enter. Move here button. And we expose a list of interaction options as well. The first option is move here. And then the second option is a description again. Description button. He, him. Jared has brown, medium, locks that are pulled back into a low ponytail and a medium deep skin tone. He has a full mustache and beard, brown eyes, white square glasses, and are wearing a brown blazer. Jared is a project manager on the HoloLens 3 team. And then some of the other options um, in this context menu involve status, which would allow me to, you know, hear a description of what this person is doing and who they're doing it with. Um, follow would allow me to. Yeah. Thanks. That was like the point that I wanted to get us to. So um, you got to hear that description that the team um, worked on also as to like, what are those layers of avatar descriptions that um, are most salient for a screen reader user and also um, like celebratory sensitive of um, like diverse and gendered features. So um yeah, this is, um, as you can see, very much taking um, the design that um, Harsha and team worked on and, um, you know, figuring out how to productize that into a 2D UI overlay. Um, yeah, thanks for the applause. It's been um, really exciting. And we've also shared this with, you know, um, like folks in game studios who are like, oh my gosh, this is so simple. This is the solution. We should do this for... Um, fill in the blank game. Um, and so um, we're excited and, you know, still figuring out um, some um, engineering architecture on the back end for the best way um, to do um, to do screen reading, since we still don't have that, um, you know, exposed metadata to use something like Windows Narrator. Um, we have some complexities to sort out there. Um, and then the next um, slide and prototype is again, um, Ami giving a tour guide. We won't um, watch the whole thing, but there was, um, you know, kind of building off of, um, you know, audio cues and um, what objects would sort of light up some data for somebody going through a room. Again, some of our key scenarios with customers and Microsoft Mesh are things like um, new join experience, um, or kind of a gallery style of interactable information in a world that um, we want to make sure that there's, um, you know, customization and a way for um, data to like light up as a user is in proximity to it. And so here's kind of another take on um, scene reading, scene weaving, um, lighting up some like audio description um, of important data in the room that's meant for those kinds of scenarios where we really wanna make sure that the new employee gets um, all the right information about data in the room, et cetera. Um, so let's play a couple minutes of um, Ami's tour of this space. Sorry, John, I'm just gonna navigate to the right point. We expose Oh, um, it's the next slide. It's the next slide. Ah, this is the last slide I have in the deck. Yeah. Yes, that's right. This is the last slide I have in the deck. Oh, this is the last slide. Oh, yeah. interesting. Um, okay. I can steal screen reading, or I can steal... Um, yeah, if you want to still share. Screen Sorry, share. Yeah. Maybe I grabbed the wrong version. That's okay.
Let's see. Can you see? Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Did you check um, record share audio as well, Talia? I did. Great, great. Yeah. Melody. Jared. Prop of the Microsoft Space Exploration Lander. Prop of the Microsoft Space Exploration Lander. So to pause really quickly, this is um, um, a similar kind of room with a couple breakout rooms um, with kind of a gallery style of content that people are wandering through simultaneously um, to explore content. Painting of a sunset behind a grassy hill. Shared PowerPoint presentation. Current slide text. We believe the metaverse will empower companies, creators, and end users to build communities and collaborate in new ways. They'll do this with safety, equity, inclusivity, privacy, and culture guiding every interaction, by design. Photo of a kitten with a bowl of cereal. Drawing of a pirate riding a dinosaur. Two essentials for any office. Fireplace. Yes. Melody. Jared. Painting of a sunset behind a grassy hill. All right. Um, yeah, so that is, um, you know, really that was the like collaboration was how do we take this incredible design work that um, Harsha and the MSR team uh, worked on and how do we figure out how to um, like build this in the mesh product um, and share it with the world. So um, we're really excited about it. We're still demoing and prototyping and figuring out the kind of engineering path for it, but um, we are on our way. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this is, this is fantastic. I mean, this is, I think, light years ahead of, of anything we've seen so far in this space. So I'm incredibly excited to have, have, uh, see your presentation here today. Um, I think we have just one or two minutes here for questions. I see one from uh, anonymous attendee. What is Microsoft's ideal vision on the end user OS? I guess, yeah, what, what's the, what's the, the long-term dream for this, I guess? I mean, I have my own opinions <laughs> about what the ideal is, but, um, you know, I do think that there needs to be an um, investment, um, you know, from Unity, from Windows, um, from, um, you know, Reality Labs and um, MetaQuest on how do we, like, invest in those APIs that... Um, expose the OS level metadata so that we don't have like every single application having a different like self-voiced app with potentially a different cadence and a different voice. And, um, you know, we know that JAWS and Windows Narrator and these OS level tools are really sophisticated, have standards that are upgraded all of the time. And that's really the best practice is to, um, you know, map to the tools that people rely on and have customizable settings for. Um, and so ideally, you know, all of these XR experiences can have, um, you know, that the, the APIs for them can be um, exposed and shared, but it's um, like a big resource lift and a big investment. Um, and I think that everyone's looking to each other as to who's going to fund, who's going to fund this work, who's going to do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's that's always part of the challenge. I know we've we've had uh, groups like the the XR Association, uh, the Better Standards Forum, um, XR Access ourselves definitely eager to facilitate work in that. So uh, to see that at least that here we have you know something to work from, something to share um, is marvelous. Uh, do you know is is how much of the work today is um, open source or available for others to experiment with? Yeah, this is all, um, you know, 
prototypes and um, demos that are internal at the moment. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, hopefully we'll we'll uh, see be able to 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 see some hands on or, or variants of it soon. Because um, uh, yeah, this is this is amazing work, and I'd love to see this implemented in all kinds of different social VR situations. Um, I know we are at the the top of the hour here. Uh, I want to be respectful of people's time, so um, I think we should probably wrap it up there. Uh, I want to thank uh, our our presenters here so much for this excellent presentation. Um, if anybody is uh, interested in seeing more of this type of material, I encourage you to check out the XR Access Symposium. Uh, our annual conference is going to be uh, June 6th and 7th, both in New York City at Cornell Tech Campus uh, and online. Um, and if anybody would like to continue the conversation, um, please don't hesitate to join our Slack, um, just xraccess.org slash Slack. Uh, and we'll be sure to to post the, uh, this video as well to our YouTube uh, so people can enjoy it from uh, here on out. Um, so that I think we'll go ahead and end it. Uh, thank you all again and uh, everybody have a have a wonderful day. Thank you for having us. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.